All right, we're going to talk today about the gift of healing. And we have some more messages coming up here, Lord willing, hopefully this coming week or so. Um, I am preparing a music or a message on music. I think I made mention of that to a couple of different people. So, uh, but that thing is turning into kind of a monster. You know, <laughs> it's like I'm actually going to have to record it in a couple separate parts and then put it all into one big file. So that's going to be, you know, it's, it's a work in progress right now. But today I wanted to talk about the gift of healing. Okay, and now the first question I want to ask is what was the first mention of healing in the Bible? And we're going to look at that here, but I want to make some interesting points first. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 is where we're going to start out this morning. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. The big debate, especially among the charismatic crowd, is uh, is there such a thing of the gift of healing today? And so I want to show you a pretty detailed study today on what healing is. There are different types of healing mentioned in the Bible. Okay, so we're going to look at that today. But I want to start out here, of course, in the Garden of Eden, there would have been no need for the gift of healing. They had perfect health. So what starts after that? What happens after that? Look here at Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Okay, notice there in verse 17 it says, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. All right, now that's a very interesting statement there. And a lot of people say, well, it's a... Uh, what happens there is, you know, the, the ground's cursed and so thorns and thistles come up. It doesn't actually say that. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, thorns also. The key word there is also. So the curse was not thorns and thistles, it's thorns also and thistles. That's something else that comes up. And I'm going to show you here, this is a theory I have, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but I'm going to try to give you my interpretation of what this curse was. Okay, now if you want to go to Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, now I want to just say this, I read almost this whole book on Friday I guess, almost the whole book of Genesis looking for the first mention of sickness, first mention of healing, and there is no mention of sickness before the flood, none. Now, Maybe it wasn't recorded, I don't know. Again, I can't be dogmatic here. I can't say that nobody ever got sick before the flood. But if they did, it's never recorded. Okay? And if you read a lot of the ages of these guys, they were living 900 years. Some more than 900 years. So something was different back then. Okay? There was, there was something there. And, you know, if, if this theory is correct, that they weren't getting sick before the flood... That could explain why they were living for 900 years. And, of course, there's a lot more to it there. You know, creation, science, evangelism. Ken Hoven brings out some good stuff on that, that there was probably a canopy of ice and what doubled the oxygen. and, and Hyperbaric oxygen. Yeah, hyperbaric oxygen pressure. chamber type of thing. Air pressure was higher. There was probably a lot of different things. It wasn't just that the ground was cursed and that made them live this long and things and didn't get sick. There was a lot to it, but that's part of it. But now look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know what happens when people are in perfect health? They don't need God. Even the most hardcore atheist, God-hating, Bible-rejecting sinner out there will turn to God and cry out to God if they get sick enough. But if you had a race of people who never got sick, it would lead to some pretty wicked, vile people. Just kind of like today. A lot of these people, there's plenty of treatments and things out there. People don't get sick as much as they did probably in the past, maybe. But the point is, it leads to sin. 
if you're good, if you're feeling good and healthy and everything all the time, you're probably going to be living in sin a lot. And if there was no penalty as far as people getting sexually transmitted diseases and things back then in the pre-flood years, they probably, you know, I mean, read Genesis chapter 6. You know, just a theory. Okay? And there's no mention at all of sickness in this entire time period. Go next to Genesis chapter 8. Now here's where it's going to tie together, and this is kind of an interesting thing. I've been over these scriptures numerous times, and it's amazing. The Bible is never a book that you just read one time and that's enough. Amen. You can read it 50 times and you'll see something new. Yeah. You know, And I saw something new here. And it's not really new, you know, it's just new to me. It's been there for, you know, a couple thousand years. All right, Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. And this is after the flood, all right? And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now did you see it? I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. Now I looked this up in a commentary or two and they said, well that just means that he did it before so he doesn't have to do it again. Well, why would he make that statement? You know, that doesn't make any sense. And it does not say, I will not again curse the ground. And I actually read this in Ruckman's commentary. And he says, see there it says, I will not again curse the ground for man's sake. He left out any more. Now, any more is the key to it right there. It's any more. He's not going to do it any more for people. I'm not going to do it again any more for these people. Now, here's the theory, Okay. And it's just a theory, okay? What if the curse that God put on the ground was these people not getting sick and these people living for 900 years? See, one of the things that you'll notice when you're a Christian is sometimes it gets downright depressing living in this world and being tempted to sin all the time. Can you imagine living for 900 years? Temptation for 900 years? See, we look at it and we go, oh, it'd be so wonderful to live for 900 years. Would it? You know? <laughs> I don't think so. You know? That might be hard for the lost world to think, you know, oh, man, I'd love to live for 900 years, you know. I don't care who you are. You'd get pretty sick and tired of life after the first 200 years. And, you know, i got 700 years to go. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> you know? I remember my grandfather. He died at 98 years old. And it was like you'd go to him for his birthday and what do you want for your birthday? I don't want anything. You know, I have all the clothes I need. I have my house is paid for, you know. I have, we have a car that's paid for, you know. I I don't need anything. You know. I don't want anything. And that was 98 years. Can you imagine 900? That would be somewhat of a curse, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Just an interesting thing there I discovered when I was looking through this, you know, the notes here for this message. And you say, but you know, I, I, I still think that it's it's just God saying I'm not going to do it again. Well then why is it why is it uh explain it here? Look at the verse, verse twenty one there. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. Now look at this. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So he's not going to curse it again for man's sake because man's heart is evil. So it's because of sin that he's saying, I'm not going to curse the ground anymore. Just a, I don't know, unique thing there that I discovered. So living for 900 years with temptation to sin that entire time, that would be a curse. <laughs> be a very interesting thing there. Uh, but anyhow, continuing on here. So what is the first sign of sickness in the Bible? What's the very first time somebody has mentioned that they get sick? Turn to Genesis chapter 12, verse 17. Here you have Abram. At this point in time, he hasn't been renamed Abraham yet. 
And he goes into Egypt and he tells Sarai, his wife, he says, act like you're my sister, you know, because I'm afraid of these guys. And so Pharaoh takes her into his house and God comes to Pharaoh and he says, you know, you're a dead man. <laughs> but look at here at uh, verse 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So there's a very, very first time that I could find that anybody was mentioned as being sick. But notice it's not a thing of he wasn't feeling well. God actually sent those plagues because of what he did. So it wasn't a thing where he was actually, you know, sick just for natural reasons. God plagued him with that sickness. Now go to Genesis chapter 20. Now we have Abraham and uh you know he's been renamed that. So it says here, and Abraham Genesis chapter 20 verse 1, excuse me. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So he did it again. <laughs> One time wasn't enough. <laughs> and by the way, if you read, you know, we're not going to be able to cover all these scriptures, but if you read there, this is after God promised Abraham, I'm going to give your wife, you know, a son. And the Bible records their age there. Abraham was 100, she was 90. Now think about that. A 90-year-old woman being attractive to a king? What did these people look like back then? Oh, well, they were kind of, they kind of were, were crouched over and they were kind of hairy and they had big jaws and, uh, 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 you know, no. Not evolution. I think if you would have seen those people back then, back when the atmosphere was a lot purer, there was no pollution, you know, they were closer to that, you know, genetically they would have been far superior to us. Probably they lived... And they probably didn't age like we do today. For a 90-year-old woman to be attractive. I mean, the guy wasn't a weirdo or anything. You know, he was a king. And he looked and he sees this, you know, beautiful woman at 90 years old. You know? And he says, I want to take her as my wife. Isn't that something? It goes very much contrary against the way most modern people think. You know, if you have a depiction of Sarah, she's some old woman, you know, and stuff like that. I don't think that was it at all. I think she was probably a very attractive woman, even at 90 years old. Why? Well, because you're going closer to the creation. They were superior to us today. But now jump down to verse 17. Genesis chapter 20, verse 17. We'll see what happened here. And of course, God put the same curse on Abimelech as He did on Pharaoh. Look at verse 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So there's your very first time that healing is mentioned in the Bible. But again, it's healing because of something that God put on man. It's not a naturally occurring sickness. So again, I think if you go back to this time period, they were probably not getting sick very often. I mean, the Bible's not going to record every time somebody gets a runny nose or a cold or something like that. I realize that. But, I mean, we have to define our beliefs by the Bible. And there's just not much sickness mentioned in the book of Genesis. I think that they were very superior people back then. So anyhow, that's the very first time that the word healed shows up. Healing, healed, heal, whatever. First time right there. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing. But now, what about the very first man who was actually sick? That it wasn't you know, a naturally occurring sickness. What about that? Genesis chapter 48. You ought to read through the book of Genesis sometime if you're kind of a new Christian because it's a very fascinating story. Genesis chapter 48 and verse 1. You have the descendants there of Abraham going down through and everything. And then you have uh, Jacob, a uh, descendant of Abraham. And he has sons, 12 sons. One of them is sold into Egypt, Joseph. And then, uh, long story, but, but basically Joseph becomes like the assistant vice 
Pharaoh, I guess you call him, and he basically saves, you know, his brethren and fulfills prophecy and everything there. Like I said, a big story. But he's down there in Egypt and he moves his whole family down to Goshen, I think it was, yeah. and they're over there and he's still ruling and reigning in, in Egypt and then he is sent word and that's where we're at here. So Genesis chapter 48 verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So there you have the very first actual man who becomes sick. And why was he sick? Well, because he was very old, first of all. But I think there was another reason for Jacob, for him being sick. And I can't cover all these verses, but... When he lost Joseph, it said about how that he rent his clothes, he ripped his clothes, and he, he grieved. And he grieved and grieved and grieved all those years. And then when Joseph was in Egypt, and the brothers came and everything to him, he said, I want you to bring your youngest brother Benjamin down here. And when Jacob heard that, he grieved again. Because he's like, I already lost Joseph, now I'm going to lose my other son? You know, my other, my youngest son, Benjamin? And so he was constantly grieving and sad and sorrowful and i'll tell you right now that's not good for your health <laughs> it's very bad for your health grieving and sorrow and stress you can't stay in that mode of of you know whatever it'll kill you yeah. and so i think that could be you know definitely a contributing factor there to jacob being sick here in his old age you know, and he did live very long, by the way, too. He lived well over a hundred years. Uh, Genesis chapter forty-nine, verse thirty-three. We'll jump over there, and he basically put, you know, he had his sons come in, and he blessed different ones of them, and kind of gave a little prophecy about what they were going to do. And it says here in verse thirty-three, and when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost, and was gathered unto his people. They didn't bury him there in Egypt. They buried him back with Abraham and, and Isaac and, and things. So, But the point is, there's the very first man who dies of sickness. You know, the other guys, when they died, it was just kind of like, you know, he died in a very good old, old age and was buried with his fathers. You know, there's really no mention of them being sick first. It was just kind of like they died. You know, and again, like I said... Maybe it just isn't recorded. Maybe they got sick of something or whatever, but it's not recorded. And you base your teachings, your beliefs off of Scripture. But now, that was the very first time that somebody died physically. Okay? But what was the first miraculous, he miraculous healing in Scripture? Okay? In other words, not a, I'm going to pray for you and hopefully the Lord will heal you. I'm talking about a miracle. Boom, instantaneous healing. What was the very first one? Does anybody know? Move your yeah. Moses. We're going to go there. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Now, if you study the story there in Genesis, what happens basically is because Jacob and his 12 sons, Joseph being the second to the youngest, he goes down to Egypt and then he brings his whole family down to Goshen, which is right beside Egypt. He dies, Joseph dies, and this Pharaoh dies. They were both good, friendly to the children of Israel. And uh, by the way, it's kind of interesting. I just want to make a little statement here. When Jacob, who's called Israel, God calls him Israel as well as Jacob, when they came down to Egypt to live in Goshen there, when they came down, there were 66 of them. And Joseph was in Egypt with his two sons. So there's Joseph and his wife and their two sons. So that's four more. So it's 70. Now it's interesting because if you have a King James Bible, there are 66 books in that book, in this book. But if you go to Egypt, Alexandria, Egypt, there's more. I don't know. <laughs> don't want to go off on a tangent there. Just thought that was kind of interesting. Wanted to make a mention of it. But basically, uh, Israel gets under bondage with Egypt. They take him as slaves. And now God says, okay, that's about enough of that. He sends in Moses to bring them out. And Moses is saying, they're not going to listen to me. You know, 
I was raised there in Egypt and everything. They're, they're not going to listen to me. And so God brings about something which becomes kind of a standard for the Jewish people. And what's that? Signs and wonders. Yep. So we have here Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. <laughs> I love that. I do the same thing. <laughs> I hate snakes. Verse 4. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and called it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. So he doesn't say to them, now I want you here, I'm going to write this thing down for you, and I want you to go read this, and I want you to explain to them scientifically how this thing's going to work. Uh uh. He says to the Jewish people, I'm going to give you signs. And this is where it starts in the book of Exodus. God deals with the Jews with signs and wonders. Okay? Remember that. That'll be important later. But you see the very first time of healing there, miraculous healing. You Put your hand into your shirt and you pull it out, it's white and leprous. You put it back in and pull it out, it's healed. There's no faith involved. There's no, I got to pray and, and hopefully the Lord, you know, if it's, if it's his will, he'll heal my hand. No, it's a miraculous, boom, instantaneous healing. That's the first time that that thing shows up. Now there are two different types of healing in scripture. First of all, the one I just mentioned, miraculous healing. Okay, this type is instantaneous. There's no prayer. There's no, you have to have faith. You have to believe that God will heal. No, a lot of the people that were healed didn't even believe a lot of times. We're going to see that as we continue in this study. And it is a sign given to the Jews to confirm the word of God. That's the purpose of miraculous healing. All right. The second type of healing is what we would consider normal types of healing. Somebody gets sick. They need prayer. You know, we've had prayer requests today for people that are sick. You know, you tell them, here's some medicine to eat. Here's some good things to eat. You need to be in better health, whatever. There's different types of healing in the Bible. But first here, we're going to look at miraculous healing. Okay, the very first time it's mentioned, we just read. All right, the Exodus chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. We just went over that. Next, Numbers chapter 21. And you're going to see a lot of this healing stuff in the Bible is actually given as instruction and righteousness for what happens later. Uh, the Bible's an amazing book. Uh, Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. Okay. Now you have the children of Israel have left Egypt and now they're traveling to the promised land. All right. Verse 4 here, it says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth, loatheth this light bread. It's kind of interesting. A type of the world in your Bible is Egypt. There's a lot of people that after they leave the world, being a type of Egypt, they kind of complain. Well, I sure had it better back there in the old life, you know. I go to, you know, I can only read my Bible now, and I can't watch R-rated movies anymore, and drink beer, and go to the bars and stuff. Mm, you know, <laughs> a lot of people are like that. A lot of people are like the Jews. There. 
And look at what the Lord does to show His love. <laughs> Verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. <laughs> you want to complain? Okay, here's some fiery serpents. Uh, verse 7, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Now look at what the Lord does here. They said, We want the serpents to be taken away. Does the Lord take them away? Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Okay, first point. God did not take away the serpents. But he provided a way to be healed. God's not going to take away sin, but he provides a way to be healed of that sin. All right? Now, did you see any faith involved there? Did you see any, uh, we need to pray about this and stuff? No. You get bit? Hey, over there, look at it quick. You better do it or you're going to die. Just look. Okay? That's a miraculous healing. This is not a healing of, well, you know, maybe you could take some cayenne pepper and a little bit of garlic and think. No. Look at the serpent. Just look over there and you're healed. Boom. Just like that. And it's kind of interesting because God actually had this as part of His plan which would come to pass over a thousand years later. You say, what's that? Well, John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay? The healing happens instantly. Today, I need to be saved. Look to the cross. Well, you know, I, I'll have to try and clean my life up first, and you know, I'll have to, uh, you know, maybe go to mass and and get baptized and confirmed. And uh, -uh. look to the cross. Healing happens instantly. All right. Kind of a little interesting thing there. Now the next one. Second Kings chapter five. Second Kings chapter 5. Now you'd think with all those miraculous things happening to the children of Israel that they'd stick with the Lord. But they don't. It's kind of frustrating <laughs> reading it. And here they've fallen away and, and they basically get taken captive. Uh, but this is kind of another interesting thing here. Second Kings chapter 5 verse 1. Now Naaman captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So he had leprosy. All right, now I want you to notice two things there. Number one, he's not a Jew. Naaman the Syrian was a Gentile. Number two, what was he king of? Syria. Where were the disciples first called Christians? Antioch. Antioch. Where is Antioch? Syria. Syria. <laughs> so you have Antioch in Syria there. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Disciples are called Christians first in Antioch. So basically that's where your King James Bible can be traced back to. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to tie that together here in just a little bit. Jump down to verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 8. And it was so when Elisha the man of God had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Naaman wanted to be healed of his leprosy, and he was basically threatening. He was saying, I'm going to be healed or you're going to be dead. <laughs> verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Verse 11, But Naaman was wroth, and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord 
his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. I mean, here you got this guy. He's a big shot. He comes with his horses and his chariots, you know, quite a show of military superpower and everything. And Elisha doesn't even come out of the house. You know, sends his crummy little messengers out, you know, go wash in the river seven times, you know. I mean, what an insult to the great general Naaman. Verse 12. Uh, Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. Here you have this warrior, this this powerful warrior. You know, if Elisha would have said, I want you to go, you know, bring me the heads of five kings, pagan kings, and I want you to go slay three lions, and he would have done that. And he just said, hey, go wash in the dirty river a couple times. Are you afraid to do that? Those are smart servants. I'm sure the Lord probably told him to say that. Uh, verse 14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Very interesting thing there, too. Naaman had to be washed before he could be clean. Hmm. Well, how are we washed? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Kind of like having the skin of a little child. Hmm, interesting there. That a Syrian, kind of like your King James Bible, which goes back to Syria, and you get washed by it. Hmm. And it said there he had to wash how many times? Seven. Seven. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Don't tell me a man wrote this book. You can go through the whole Bible and there's so much that just interlaces and just ties together and this goes to here and that goes to there and you couldn't write a book like that. No way. This is God's book. King James Bible. And it's interesting because if you use a new version, a lot of these scriptures are messed up. Those tie-ins are gone. Completely eliminated. And a lot of times, there's not even manuscript evidence for it. They're changing scriptures without any manuscript. Even from the corrupted manuscripts from Alexandria, Egypt, they're, they're not even translating those a lot of times. Why? Well, because the Holy Spirit's not behind these new versions. But now let's go to the New Testament. We're going to see some more miraculous healings in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, verse 29. And of course, you know, there's no, absolutely no way I could go over all the healings here, the miraculous healings in the Gospels, because there's quite a few of them. But uh, the Lord has a way of doing things so that people can't copy Him. As I said, this is God's book. It can't be copied, you know, by these wicked apostates out there. Continuing here, Matthew chapter 15, verse 29. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. It doesn't say that he told them, you know, I'll pray for you and hopefully you'll be healed. You know, let me know how it went. He healed them. Verse 31, In so much that the multitude wondered. If somebody's just saying, hey, I hope you get better, there's no wonder there. That's not a miracle. Okay? When you're laying hands on people and they're being healed, that would cause wonder. Continuing here, When they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Alright? And these were Jews that he was ministering to, by the way. These weren't Gentiles. There could have been some Gentiles present, you know, kind of looking, what in the world's going on over there? But these were Jews. He came to the Jewish people. But now I just want to make a point here. 
As I said before, no praying or faith was involved. He was putting his hands on people and they were being healed. Now, a couple of those things in those two verses there, 30 and 31, you could fake people that were lame, people that were blind, people that were dumb. dumb. You could fake those people being healed. You pay a couple of actors, you know, come up, act like you're blind, you know, we'll put a rag around your eyes or something, they'll lead you up in with a cane or something. You can do that. Somebody that's dumb, you know, they can't speak, you know, they can't hear, whatever. Somebody that's uh, lame, you know, you bring them up in the wheelchair, you know, and, and all this stuff. And, I mean, you know, I have video of Jim Jones doing that. You know, his secretary, his one of his secretaries, they pretended that she was lame. And he healed her, you know, miraculously. But guess what? The Lord doesn't let it end there. He puts a group in there that you can't fake. The maimed to be whole. Here's some guy that was in the war and he lost a leg, had his leg chopped off by somebody's sword or something like that. And they, he comes up on the crutches, you know, and the Lord goes over and he goes, be healed, whap, hits his leg, poof, and the leg comes out. You can't fake that, you know? Oh, I believe in the gift of healing for today. Okay, we're going to go down to the VA hospital. We're going to go in there to some of them soldiers that lost their legs or an arm in the war. And I want you to show me the maimed becoming whole. I want to see it. Well, I believe it. I believe it for today. Okay, show it to me. All right? Sorry, but they're not going to be able to. Now, as I said, there are many, many cases. We can't hit them all. But we're going to go to Mark chapter 16. Jesus was there. He was confirming the word to the Jewish people with signs and wonders. But now he dies on the cross. He's ready to go back up to heaven. And he's ready to commit the ministry to the disciples. He wants them to go out. That's what we have here in Mark chapter 16, verses 14 through 20, which incidentally have been taken out of a lot of the new versions or questioned. Interesting that they would do that. All right, here, verse 14. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them uh, which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let me stop there for just a second. You see there a reproof came before their instructions. So he kicked them around a little bit before he gave them their orders, their marching orders. All right, uh, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Look at verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. The word tongues in your Bible is just another word for languages. They're used interchangeably. Verse 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and after a while they shall recover. Does it say that? No, it says, and they shall recover. Lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. No time involved there. Boom. It's miraculous, instantaneous healing. That's what you have there. Verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. That's the purpose of signs in your Bible. Now, what was the very first healing after Jesus ascended back up to heaven? Turn to the book of Acts. Jesus goes up in Acts chapter 1. And the Holy Ghost comes down to Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 3, verse 1. All right, it says here in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. He did not ask to be healed. Keep that in mind. Verse 4, And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. 
and he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. He wasn't expecting to be healed. He was thinking money. Verse 6, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement, at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Okay? Did he have any faith to be healed? No. He was expecting money. Was there any interval of time there between them saying that and him getting healed? No. It was instant. Okay? This was not a faith healing. This was an instant, instantaneous, miraculous healing. Well, I believe it's still for today. Glory to God. Okay, prove it. I want to see it. I want to see somebody who's legitimately, I'll pick them out. <laughs> you know, we'll go to the hospital. I'll pick one. And then I want you to heal him instantly. I don't believe it. I don't believe it for one second. And where was this done, by the way? In a Jewish synagogue. So he was confirming the signs to the Jewish people. Now look what happens here in verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Oh, did they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and pray for the initial evidence to speak? No. They were just simply revealing God's power, confirming the Word with signs following. But yet if you're into the whole modern healing, speaking in tongues movement, they'll tell you, well, you'll have to seek the Holy Ghost and you have to do this and you have to do that. And it's going to be by your own holiness that you heal people. Right? Right there kind of contradicts it, doesn't it? That whole system? Sure it does. But who was Peter addressing? You say, well, I think he was talking to a, a group there that came to his church, you know, and, and they were holding a healing meeting. Look at verse 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, he's speaking to Jews, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was term determined to let him go. Uh, verse 14, But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. You people are murderers and we were witnesses to it. Now how many of these healing guys, how many of them will rebuke the crowd that they're speaking to like that? They don't. You know why? Because they're after their money. We're not dealing with the same type of a thing here. Okay? Not even close to being the same. Look at verse 16. And his name through faith and his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that, ye through, that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. In other words, he's saying, you should have known about this. Okay, The things that were prophesied there back in the past, Isaiah 53 in particular, about the coming Messiah, Jesus fulfilled all this stuff. Okay, You did this ignorantly because your leaders aren't teaching you the Bible, essentially. you know They denied the Messiah that came. All right? That's why this guy was, was raised up. It's by the faith of Jesus Christ. Okay, Not that the guy himself had the faith, but it's that you know, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. It was the faith that Peter and John had that healed that guy, essentially. Now, look at verse 19. So you have there that uh, they told him, you know, they rebuked him, and then they said, you did this ignorantly. You should have known that he was your Messiah. Now look at verse 19. Believe ye, therefore, 
and be converted. Now it says repent. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. All right? Repentance comes before belief. What do you have to repent of? You have to repent of your self-righteousness. That's the reason most people don't get saved. They trust in their own self-righteousness. I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not going to go to hell. God will, you know, If God judges me, he'll know the good things that I did. You have to turn away from that. You have to realize that you're a sinner and that your only hope is, is salvation through Jesus Christ. And then until you come to God as a sinner, you're not going to get saved. Just as simple as that. Okay, now we're going to go to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Here they basically, the leaders of the synagogue bring them you know, before them. And uh, I just had to include this verse here. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Kind of interesting because we deal with the same thing today. Oh, you're uneducated. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I'm saved and you're lost. <laughs> you know, incredible. But the thing is there, they saw the man who was healed standing there and they couldn't say anything about it. Why? Well, because it was a miracle, a genuine miracle that was done in the sight of all the people. The people knew who the guy was. Now, if you were Gentiles, the Gentiles would say, well, you know, I think that maybe uh, because the moon's aligned at that particular, you know, they try to explain it away. But now with the Jews, the Jews said, hey, this is a legitimate miracle. We can't say anything against it. See, they're different than the Gentile people. All right, now we're going to go to uh, uh, verse 21 there in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, and they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Miracle of healing. Okay? It was a miracle. It was a miraculous healing, just like I've been saying. Alright, uh, verse 29. Go down to verse 29 there in Acts chapter 4. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness thy, they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. You know, one of the manifestations of the Holy Ghost is speaking the word of God with boldness. And a lot of these charismatic healer types, they don't speak the word of God with boldness. <laughs> you know, they talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah, you know, I've been getting, an, it's it's amazing to me, the group that attacks me worse than anybody else, anybody else are charismatics. They'll hit me more than, than Catholics. You know, the Catholics come in, you're a heretic, blah, 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 blah. But the charismatics, they're rough on me. I've had him tell me, you know, just here in the last week, you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost, you're not saved, you don't have the Holy Ghost in you, and all this other stuff. And they never quote any scripture to back it up. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. But you see there, the thing again, stretch forth thy hand, thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. So you see it there again, the thing of signs and wonders. And at this point in time in the book of Acts, they're still, still dealing with the nation of Israel predominantly. Now go to Acts chapter 5, verse 12. We're just going to be hitting a couple examples here. There are many in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. They weren't down at the local mall or something like that, where the, you know, or the marketplace or something where the Gentiles were. They were right there in front of the Jewish synagogue doing this stuff. That's why they were getting in trouble all the time. Verse 13, and, no, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women, 
insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. We're not dealing with faith healing here. Not even close. They were all healed. How, show me a charismatic meeting where everybody's healed. Instantly. I don't believe it. Okay? We're not dealing with the same thing. Look at verse 17. And we're going to see their respect here among the Jewish leaders. Then the high priest uh, rose up, and all the, they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. <laughs> Call that proselytizing. Yep. You know? I was over that a couple different times, you know, and I've actually been to churches, and they say, you know, you shouldn't speak to people that are members of other churches. You know, that's proselytizing. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> uh, excuse me? What they're saying, really, a lot of times when you have these big churches say you shouldn't proselytize, they're saying, as a corporation, you shouldn't try to steal customers from another corporation. Right. That's what it is. There's nothing in Scripture about, well, you shouldn't talk to a Catholic and try to draw them out of their church and bring them over to your church. You know, or even, you know, we'll go lesser than that, a Methodist or a Presbyterian, you shouldn't tell them about the corruption of their organization that they're in, their denomination, because that's proselytizing. Show me that in Scripture. It's not in there. Brian, it's you crazy. Mean, you mean, don't steal my money? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Don't steal don't, my money? Don't steal my customers. Yeah. That's what that means. But you see there, the Lord is, is the one that's busting them out of prison, by the way, too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, my how things have changed. Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Uh, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Uh, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and, to, and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So again, there you see the thing of repentance and forgiveness of sins. Okay, continuing on here. Uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 8 and yeah, verse eight and 9. And you, here you have Stephen. He goes on to be the first martyr. And it says here, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So you see there the thing again of confirming the word with signs following. Verse 9, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, hmm, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Now, if you go with the modern version scholarship, you know, the destructive textual criticism of today, they will tell you that the true manuscripts come from Alexandria. And yet you read through the New Testament here, through the book of Acts, you don't see much good scholarship coming from Alexandria. Here's a corrupt scholar that comes, one of them, and he's an Alexandrian, where the word is being corrupted over there in Alexandria, Egypt, and those manuscripts are still around the day. And he actually is one of the ones that rises up and disputes with Stephen and ends up killing him. He was probably throwing rocks there at the end of Acts chapter 7. And it's kind of interesting because the modern Alexandrian scholars are the same mindset. They hate Bible believers. Now, I'm not talking about ones that are just ignorant and don't know any better. I'm talking about the ones that really know the Bible version issue. All right, a couple more places here in Acts, and then we're going to hit a few more verses, and then we're done. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Of course, there, Acts chapter 7, uh, at the end of it, they do kill Stephen. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and they that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Now the 
Samaritans there were kind of a lower class of Jew, but they were still essentially Jewish people. So he's there in Samaria performing these miracles in front of Jewish people. All right, he's dealing with the Jews. Now, you say, well, what, you know, if I'm sure if, if uh, Philip would meet a Gentile, he'd probably perform signs and miracles for him too, right? No, we're going to see that. Acts chapter 8, verse 27. Okay, and it says here, And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, and a, a an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should show me a sign and wonder? <laughs> No, it says, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And you go down through the story there. Again, we're not going to cover it. But you go down through the story there and Philip explains to this Ethiopian. So he explains to the Gentile what the scripture is saying, the prophecies of Isaiah chapter 53, to a Gentile. He doesn't say, hey, Hold on a second. Stop reading. I'm gonna look. There's a blind guy. Watch this. Watch. I'm gonna go heal him. Bam. He doesn't do it. Why? Well, there in First uh, Corinthians chapter. I guess we can turn there. You might as well turn there. First Corinthians chapter one. This is a key scripture here. Verse twenty-two. First Corinthians one twenty-two. This is a key scripture to understanding what the whole signs and wonders thing is about. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greeks there, and of course any other type of Gentile. You want to get to a Gentile, you're going to have to explain things to them, explain the scriptures to them. But a Jew, they require a sign. You know, that's why they're asking Jesus for signs all the time. Okay, now we're not going to read the verse there, but if you want to hear the rest of the story about the Ethiopian eunuch, you can go back there in Acts chapter 8 and read it. And he gets saved. He gets baptized and saved in verse 37. Mm -hmm. Unless you have an NIV, then he doesn't get saved. He just, you know, nothing happens there because verse 37 is gone. So, and of course, there are many more miraculous healings, instantaneous healings in the book of Acts. We can't possibly cover them all. But they always are connected with Jews being present. And right there, Acts chapter 8 is a perfect example. Philip, when he's around the Jews, he's performing signs and miracles. He meets a Gentile and he says, okay, let me explain the scripture to you. No signs and wonders. Okay? Interpreting scripture with scripture. Not with feeling, not with blind feeling. Now go to the big disputed passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, I do believe that some of these gifts, a lot of these gifts are still around, okay? But some of them obviously have disappeared. We're going to see about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Don't be ignorant. You know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Let me stop there for just a second. A lot of these people say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. It doesn't say that. It says Jesus is the Lord. Definitive article before a singular word. Jesus is the Lord. Verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given the Spirit 
by, or is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom to another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit to another, faith by the same Spirit to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit to another, the working of miracles to another, prophecy to another, discerning of spirits to another, diff, diverse kinds of tongues to another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Okay, now I want you to notice something. Verse 9, jump back up there to verse 9. Does it say gift or gifts of healing? Gifts. It's plural. Why is it plural? If you can heal people by just laying your hand on them and saying, be healed, boom. Why do you need more than one? See? Something changed there. Okay, the gift of healing that they had back there in the book of Acts to confirm the word to the Jews... You don't, you know, here's a guy who has a broken arm, you go over and whap, be healed. Here's a guy who's sick, he's got a fever, boom, be healed. You lay hands on the sick, they recover. You don't need gifts for that. But now what happens today that we don't have miraculous healing? If you want to be, help people, you know, healing-wise, you need to know different things, don't you? There are gifts of healing. Okay, there are bacteriological and viral type of infections. That requires a different type of healing than the type that is there for people who have a broken arm or cut their leg off or cut themselves really bad. See, there are gifts, plural, of healing today. And I do believe that there are Christians that have those gifts of healing. There are some Christians that are good at all aspects of that. You do have some Christian doctors that can go and do surgery and they also know about natural health, and they tell people about prevention, staying in good shape, good health. There's a lot of different gifts of healing. Okay, What's going on here in Corinthians is not the same thing as what was going on back there with the miracles, the signs and wonders. It's a different thing. Okay, And we're going to have some messages coming up here. Like I said at the beginning, uh, Brother Jesse's putting them together right now, the, the different uh, Bible and health messages. There's a lot that you can learn there. A lot about diet, a lot about eating proper things, a lot about, you know, I mean, there's, it's just a huge, huge field of research out there. You know, things that we've gotten away from, okay? And, I mean, you can go off on that for a very long time. But uh, I want you to notice something here, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. We're going to go over there. You say, well... You know, what about this gift of healing thing? Has that gone away? You know, because you, you see some things there, prophecy and, and tongues and things like that. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Did it say anything about healing going away? No. You're always going to have the need to heal people. Okay, <clears throat> that's, you know, there's always going to be somebody that's sick out there. But has the miraculous sign gift of healing gone away? Yeah. But I will say this, as far as, you know, the apostolic thing of apostles walking around and, per, you know, confirming the word with signs following, I don't believe in that anymore. But could, could God miraculously heal somebody? If he wanted to, sure. But... As a sign gift given to confirm the word of the Jews, that's not here. And you say, well, I believe it is. Okay, prove it. It's just as simple as that. You know, I believe in the miraculous gift of, you know, the Holy Ghost can heal somebody instantly by me laying my hands on. Okay, we'll go to the hospital and I'll require some proof. Just as simple as that. There's no debate. There's no debate. And by the way, the point has been made in the past and I'll make it again. If this sign gift of healing is there and I can lay hands on the sick and they can recover. Why are you doing it in churches? Why don't you go down to the hospital and heal people? Yeah. Clear it out. See? No, you got to go into the church building and you got to con poor people that are sick into giving their money. It's a scam. It's a game. The more money you give me, the better chance you have to get healed. No scripture at all to back that up. None. Absolutely none. It's a con artist game. It's been played for a long time now. It's just disgusting that they would prey on sick people. I mean, you've got to be a low scum. I mean, yeah. 
lower than pond scum to do something like that. And by the way, too, uh, you say, well, they weren't doing it in the hospitals back there in the Bible. No, but they were doing it out in front of a Jewish synagogue in the public. Okay, and the people were coming to them. They weren't choosing people that they had pre-planned, you know, to let's stage the thing. Uh -uh. So you say, well, I'm going to do it the scriptural way. Okay, go out in front of a Jewish synagogue and heal people in public that are coming to you. Instantaneous healing. I'd like to see it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it for one second. Not going to con me that way. So, and by the way, you can listen to the message on tongues. Uh, it says there in 1 Corinthians 12, it says about uh, verse 10, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. There's no interpretation of tongues in the book of Acts. We're dealing with something different here. And I do believe in that diverse t kinds of tongues thing being a gift of the Holy Ghost in that some people are really good at learning a lot of different languages. Okay? God blesses them with that wisdom. God blesses some of the brethren with musical ability. I have none. You know? <laughs> As they say, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. You know, kind of a thing. I mean, I don't have musical ability. I don't have the ability to learn diverse kinds of languages or tongues as it says here. Okay, I have a gift of teaching. I have some other gifts that the Lord's given me. A little tiny bit of a gift of healing. I know a little bit about that. But there again, I don't, I don't have all that stuff figured out. But see, the purpose of the body of Christ is not that we should all be programmed robots doing the same thing. We all have diverse kinds of gifts, diverse kinds of things that we can do. That's what's going on here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is not miraculous healing that you're seeing there. It's a different thing. That's why it says gifts. Now, in conclusion here, we're going to hit a couple more scriptures and then we're done. Uh, today we are left basically with three ways to handle sickness. Okay, The miraculous instantaneous healing of the apostles, the sign gift, is gone. It's not here. First of all, you have prayer. Turn to James chapter 5. Say, so what do you do when you get sick? You know, I have a family member that's sick and, and they're not feeling well and everything. You know, what are we supposed to do? You know, I, I have a grandmother right now who's in the hospital. It'd be nice to be able to just go in and just say, be healed, bang, and she gets up and everything's fine. But that's not here anymore. Okay? So what do you do? James chapter 5, verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, I do believe that this book is specifically to tribulation saints. I do believe that because it says in James chapter 1, verse 1, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. That's subject for another study. It's been covered before. But the point is, I do believe instruction and righteousness-wise that the elders of the church, or you know anybody really in the church, can come and they can, I do believe in the thing of laying on of hands, not instantaneous, be healed, you know, it's praying right there. You see the thing of praying. It's different than the sign, the apostolic sign gift of instantaneous healing. They're laying hands on the sick and they're praying for them. Okay? But you see, part of it there is the thing about, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, that's not specifically comes right out at you but the point is if somebody's sick you should say hey you know you confessed up here is there some reason why the lord's doing this to you you know that has to be part of it that's not a comfortable thing always <laughs> you know but sometimes you have to ask that question so do i believe in this verse for today yeah i do i think that it's a good thing for people in the church if a member is sick or somebody's sick you go to them and you say you know let's pray for you and you put your hand on their head or on their shoulder or even just hold their hand or something like that and pray for them and talk to them. Just say, you know, is there some reason that this is happening? You, can you think of anything? Are you confessed up? You know, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You confessed up, you know, get that stuff covered. So, yeah, I do believe in this one. So you have prayer there. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. We look at the second thing here way to heal somebody today. <clears throat> Sometimes your sickness is not a matter of God punishing you for sin. Sometimes it's just, you know, you have to change your diet a little bit. 
First Timothy chapter five verse twenty three says here, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Okay, if you have problems with digestion and, and things like that, sometimes fermented grape juice can actually help that. Okay, and this is not a proof text for getting drunk either, That's by right. the way. <laughs> You know, well, I can drink wine because it's approved there by Paul to Timothy. No, it doesn't work that way. Medicinal use. Yeah, it's medicinal use. Okay, um, and there's a lot of things out there. I mean, you know, we we are big hero natural health types of remedies and cures and things. You know, if I get a cold, the last place I'm ever going to go to is a doctor right. or a hospital. <laughs> you know, no, thank you. you know, well, you can get a vaccination for that. No, <laughs> you know. I, I don't have the article here, but they had a thing in the paper here recently about how that uh, they have a shingles vaccine. And they and it's some doctor who wrote the thing, and he said, you know, basically we're giving you shingles in the vaccine, and, uh, you know, it's made so that your body, you know, has an immune reaction to it, and then you don't get the vaccine because we gave it to you, or, you know, or you don't get the virus because we gave it to you. But, you know, in a small number of people, they actually get shingles. It's like, well, they're putting it in your body. What do you think is going to happen, you know? And I heard recently uh, Dr. Scott Johnson, I was listening to him on the vaccine thing, and he said that the whooping cough deal or whooping cough, however you want to say it, you know, they had a vaccine for it, and they said 86% of the people that get the vaccine actually get this whoop, whooping cough or whatever, yeah. you know. Don't get vaccines. That's That stuff's bad for you, man. Flu vaccine and all that other junk. Study that stuff. Bad for you. Really bad. So what was the thing here? Well, Timothy just needed to change his diet a little bit. Okay, so sometimes it's not a thing of you're sinning or, you know, God's punishing you or whatever. Sometimes it's just a matter of you got to change a little bit of what you're eating. And if, uh, if this is a pastoral epistle and Paul's giving him some advice on what he needs to do, He's going to be under an awful lot of stress, which is going to affect your stomach mm -hmm. if you're in the ministry. Yeah. No doubt about that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Right, right, Brian? Oh, no, never. No, <laughs> I, I don't ever have any stress associated with ministry. Um, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. <clears throat> Uh, it says here, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. He knows that the rewards are there. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means... When I have preached to others, I myself should be should be a castaway. Uh, you need to stay in good shape. That's something that's there as a Christian. If you don't, well, you'll become a castaway eventually. That's something that we all have to go through. Okay, and you know, a little illustration here. And I'd really like to go off on a big rabbit trail on this one, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, many Americans, <clears throat> many Americans want to live on junk food which is kind of like sin. And then they take care of their health, salvation, after things get bad. It's not a good idea. <laughs> you know. And something you ought to keep in your mind every time you go to pick up a, a piece of junk food is, okay, my flesh wants this. It's not the Holy Spirit telling you to eat it. You know, I mean, for me, I'm allergic to chocolate. I get headaches when I eat chocolate. You know, And for me, and you say, well, then you never eat chocolate? I wish I could say that, <laughs> but I don't. Sometimes I'm stupid, you know. And But I'm trying to train myself that when I pick up that piece of chocolate, I say to myself, okay, my flesh wants it, but am I willing to pay the price? I am now going to sow to the flesh. Am I willing to the flesh to reap corruption? Right. Every time you eat junk food, every time you sin, spiritual application there, you're sowing to the flesh. Okay? Well, maybe it won't come up. Maybe it won't reap corruption. Sorry, it's a law of science. Yeah. You sow to the flesh, you will to the flesh reap corruption. Just the way it is. So, sometimes prayer can make you better. Sometimes you need to change your diet. Sometimes you need to get exercise. But what about the third one? And this is where we're going to conclude. 
2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I was looking up at the uh, heading there. (laughs) 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Okay, here we have Paul. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Did Paul get this thorn in the flesh because he was living in sin? No, he wasn't doing anything wrong. But lest that curse that we talked about back there in Genesis of living in perfect health and living a very long life, that temptation to sin is there, you know, because you really don't need God. You're in perfect health. So that wouldn't happen. The Lord said, go ahead, Satan, thorn in the flesh. Verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Hmm. Boy, is that contrary to modern Christianity, Mm -hmm. to the prosperity gospel. And you know what's funny? A lot of the lost world, when they see a Christian get sick, they'll say, why would God allow that? They don't understand the nature of God. They don't understand that it's actually a curse to always live in perfect health and to never be sick and to never feel a need for God. Okay, You should want to be in communion with God. And right there, Paul's saying, I take glory. In my infirmities. <laughs> That's rough. I don't like being sick. I hate being sick. <laughs> I mean, when I get sick, when I have a fever and I'm and I got a headache and things, I mean, I go down. I get depressed. But you know what I do? I pray a lot of times. That's rough. I don't like thinking about that. But it's interesting. Another point I want to make here. Do you realize what these charismatic healers are saying? When they're saying you can be healed, if you just believe you can be healed, they're trying to take away your spiritual power. <laughs> if you want, if you can be healed of anything and you can be in perfect health, you'll have no power spiritually. Mm-hmm. Think about that. That's not God's design for you. You see, a strong Christian is one that can go out and they can do things for the Lord while they're feeling sick. You know, one of the most convicting men that's out there alive right now is Sam Gipp, Dr. Sam Gipp. He had an injury, injured his neck, and he was almost headache. His headaches would last for three months sometimes. Preaching, driving around, going, you know, having people argue with him and stuff like that. Preaching, three months, headache. That's rough. Another one of my heroes in the faith is Oliver Cromwell. He was sick all the time. Guy's out there charging into battle, you know, on a horse, and he's fighting with a sword and stuff like that, and he's got a fever, you know, 104 degrees or something like that. You know, he's out there feeling like he's going to puke or something. You know, guy's sick. Out there fighting battles. Man, amazing. And that guy, you study him, you know, he was a Calvinist, his Puritan, whatever else, you know, some issues there. But he was a powerful man of God. He would preach, you know. I'd love to hear that guy preach. (laughs) But, you know, before he'd make a decision, he'd go out into the wilderness for three days and pray for three days. You know, sometimes longer. I mean, those guys back then were something else. Those men back then. Just incredible. So, is the sign gift of healing for today? No. Is the gifts of healing for today? Are the gifts of healing for today? Yes. Yes. I do believe in the gifts of healing. And you're going to be hearing about some of it coming up here, some of the things of prevention, the right time or the right types of food to eat, the right types of things, diets and and whatever else that you can live to keep yourself from getting sick all the time. Okay, now I do think that you should pursue that. I do think that you should stay in as good a health as you can. But if you do get sick, pray that the Lord heals you. Try to change your diet. And if the Lord doesn't 
do anything for you after all that. Take glory in your infirmities. Say, well, I guess the Lord wants me to have this sickness, whatever it is. Okay? So that's going to be it for this morning. I guess we'll close here with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as always, I always like to thank You for Your Word. You didn't leave us in the dark, Lord. We, we uh, aren't down here ignorantly walking around not knowing what You want for us, what Your plans are for us. Um, your Word is just such a precious possession. And uh, I do thank You, Lord, that I know everybody here is in pretty good health. None of us are, are dying of any kind of a major disease or whatever else. I know some of the saints out there are. I know some of them are suffering from sickness. They are suffering from illnesses that they've prayed about. They've try, tried to change their diets. And they're still sick. And I pray, Lord, that they would thank you for those sicknesses and that they would try to seek uh, how they might glorify you through that illness, through that sickness. And Lord, if any of us here ever get to that point where we get sick and we can't be healed of that sickness, I pray, Lord, that uh, we would find the joy in that and that we would be a great witness to other people. I know one of the, the worst witnesses out there, Lord, is when a Christian is sick and like the Israelites back there in the Old Testament, they complain about it. And uh, that's a bad testimony to the lost world, Lord. And I just pray that none of us here would fall into that trap, but we would be strong, that we, we would be ready always to give an answer to every man. And uh, I just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.